Hi everyone, welcome to Biology 1124, Investigations in Introductory Biology. My name is Sarah Ward and I will be your instructor this semester. I'm very excited to have each one of you in class and I'm looking forward to getting to know you guys a bit better and having a great semester moving forward. Just some basic housekeeping as we begin. My email address is sarah.ward at ou.edu, and this is my preferred method of communication. It's going to be how you can reach me and get answers to your questions the quickest. Per the university guidelines, I will need you to contact me using your OU account as well, so please don't use a private email. Let's keep all communications to our official OU accounts. My office hours are Tuesday afternoons from 1 to 5 p.m. During these hours, I'll be around my computer to respond to emails quickly, and I'll also be available for Zoom meetings if you ever have any questions, concerns about your grades, or really anything about the class that you would like to go over. Feel free to contact me and we can set up a meeting to talk about your concerns. I can be available other times as well. Just send me an email and we can figure out a time that works for you if you're not available on Tuesday afternoons. As for what to call me, basically any of these first three. I'm fine if you call me Sarah, Miss Ward, Ms. Ward, don't really care. Whatever it is that you're most comfortable with, go with that. I would prefer if you did not call me Mrs. Ward because that's not my correct title. And likewise, I haven't earned the titles of doctor or professor yet, so just stick to one of the first three and we'll be all good. Just whatever you prefer. A bit about me. I was born and raised in West Virginia. I then moved to South Carolina where I got a bachelor's of science degree in zoo and wildlife biology from Bob Jones University. I then went on and got a master's of science degree in biological sciences from Southeastern Louisiana University. And now I'm here at OU in the EEB department getting a PhD. A bit about my research interests broadly are fish, and a bit more specifically, I'm interested in deep sea fish evolution. So if you've seen Finding Nemo, you're probably familiar with the top right image. Uh, from the scene, and the bottom right is a picture of what those fish actually look like. I think they're both pretty cool, so I'm just really interested in deep sea fish in general. This top right picture is um, an image of an anglerfish I actually got to hold from a museum collection that I visited a few months ago. And then just for fun, my favorite animal is the rosy of backfish, which you can see here in the lower left of the screen. It's just so ugly, so weird. One of my favorite animals, and I thought I would share that with you as well. My pets are Tad Cooper, which is here in the bottom right. He's the bearded dragon. Wheatley, who is a corn snake in the bottom left. Lester, who is my crested gecko here in the middle bottom. And then Boomer is a dog that I foster for one of the local shelters. Um, and all of these are my babies and I love them a lot. So if you have any pets, I'm sure we can have some sort of connection. And I would always love to see pictures of them as well. <laughs> this is what I look like. The left is me doing field work last winter. Um, and the right is what I'll more likely look like whenever you guys see me um, wearing my mask. So just to know what to expect, this is what I look like. Now moving on into course content. What will we actually be doing in the lab? The point of the lab section is to actually get to hands-on apply the concepts that you're learning in lecture. So you're going to be learning big scale ideas from your professors in lecture, and a lab will be using scientific tools and methods to apply those concepts and really help you get some hands-on experience learning all of these different things. So we'll do this by designing and performing experiments, collecting data, 
and then we'll make graphs and posters from that data to communicate with our lab mates things that we've done. And most of all, we will be creative, we'll be collaborative, and we will hopefully have some fun. I know science isn't necessarily everyone's favorite subject, but presumably you all have some sort of interest in it. And I hope that if you don't, you'll at least give it an honest chance and we can hopefully find something that you'll think is cool as well. It is important that you look at the course policies that are listed in Canvas. An important thing to note is you have a separate lab canvas from your lecture canvas. So all of the communications for this course, 1124, will be on your lab canvas. And it's important to keep yourself up to date with all of the documents and policies we have on that site. So again, make sure you read it thoroughly so you understand the policies, procedures, and the schedule. You guys are in college now, so I'm not going to necessarily be sending email reminders or such things. So do keep up with the syllabus. Um, that's just a way that you can know what I'm expecting from you, and I'll also stick with that syllabus as well, so that we're all on the same page of what's due when. So keep an eye on that. One of the things that you can find in these course policies, but which tends to be a big question, so we'll touch on that briefly now, is what happens if you miss a lab? In short, we drop the lowest lab grades. So if you happen to get sick, you get a flat tire, you have a family emergency, whatever it is that comes up, you don't have to sweat about it the first time it happens because we will drop that lowest grade. If you get to come to every single class, that's great. Um, and then that just gives you some flex time if you didn't understand a concept super well or if you're having a bad day, whatever it is, for whatever reason, we will drop your lowest score at the end of the semester from a lab. And then what assignment is required for admission to lab? We will have some pre-lab activities every week where you answer some questions and you will need to bring this with you. So it's a document that you can print off from the Canvas page um, and you'll need to answer these questions, show them to me at the beginning of class so that I know that you've done them. And then also we'll usually have some sort of graphing or data collection thing that you'll also do on those sheets. So it's important that you have a physical copy, um, not necessarily like an iPad, try to print that off and have it on a paper copy that you can bring with you to lab every single week. So what types of assignments will you complete? We will have a lab quiz every week at the start of the lab on Top Hat. You only need one Top Hat account for all of your classes. So the same one that you would need for lecture, you can also use for this lab. It is important that you're punctual to class because we will be starting the class with this quiz and I'm not gonna be able to open it back up for you if you're late. So make sure you allow yourself some extra time so that you can get here. We will also have some written summaries of the week's investigation and you'll need to make a graph of your data. There's a format on, of this on Canvas. So make sure you take a look at that example so that you know what I'm talking about here and know what your expectations are. And finally, at the end of the semester, you will present a poster presentation via Zoom of an experiment you've completed this semester. You'll get some more details on this later on, so don't worry about this right now. Just something to keep in the back of your mind that this is something that's coming up at the end of the semester. So what resources are available to you? Again, Canvas is a great place to start. You'll have the lab manual, which will give you tips for designing, graphing, and writing. And those are all very important skills that we'll be using again and again through the course of the semester. And if you're a science major throughout the course of your whole career. So this is important that you familiarize yourself with that. There'll also be investigation modules which will have a lab background and go over the procedures that we'll be going over in lab and also have some tutorial videos. Anything in any of these modules from the background to the procedures to the videos, anything that's on Canvas here is fair game for the lab quizzes. So it's really doing yourself a favor 
if you make sure that you go over this thoroughly before class so that you would do well on the quizzes. Now, moving on to lab safety. Obviously, we are in COVID times, so masks are going to be required at all times in the lab. We also are requiring eye protection, so safety glasses, goggles, or face shields while you're in the lab. Just normal prescription eyeglasses are not suitable for this. They have to wrap around all the way, all the way around the sides of your faces um, and come close to the face so that it's protective. This is something I'm going to be required to enforce. So please make sure that you always have your mask, always have your eye protection, um, and just have that ready at the start of lab. Ex unless the experiment itself calls for it, you're not required to wear gloves while you're in lab. But we do have lots of soap and lots of hand sanitizer, so make sure that you are washing your hands often. And also, this isn't specific to COVID, but just general lab safety. Always wear closed-toed shoes. We work with various chemicals and reagents throughout the semester, and spills happen. They are just a fact of life. No matter how careful you try to be, somebody is going to spill something this semester. And it's just best if we have closed-toed shoes, sneakers, boots, something like that, that will protect your feet if something gets spilled on you. We also are not allowing any food or drink in the lab. You can have a closed bottle of a drink, water or something in your backpack. But in order to take a drink, you're going to need to step out of the hall to remove your mask, take the drink, put the mask back on, then come back in the classroom. As far as food goes, if you have a medical reason where you can't go three hours without eating, go ahead and talk to me as soon as possible, and we can figure out arrangements for that. But in general, if you do not have a medical reason, then it's best to just plan on not bringing any snacks, no food. Just plan on having a water bottle that you can step in the hall to drink, but otherwise don't have anything to eat or drink in the lab. And finally, just keep your phones put away. Not only is that distracting to you, but it's distracting to your lab mates. It's distracting to me when I'm trying to lecture. And also, again, there's spills in the lab. So it'd be really awful if your lab mate, for example, knocked over a beaker right onto your new iPhone 11. You'd be upset. They'd be upset. Everyone is going to be upset. So it's just best to keep your phone put away where it's safe and out of sight. Now, for today's exercise, we are going to design a simple experiment to give you some practice. I would recommend that you take notes in your lab book so that you can write some stuff down and get the most out of this exercise. So an issue the scientists have discovered is that honeybee populations are decreasing in Baton Rouge in Louisiana, and they're trying to figure out the causes of these population declines. So I want you to think for a second, what factors could contribute to population decline? This is a good place to go ahead and pause this video and maybe write down one, two, however many ideas you come up with of what are some factors that could contribute to this population decline. It's best if you do come up with a reason or two um, before you go on in this video, instead of just listening for me to give you the answer in the next couple seconds. Some common answers to this question is that maybe the population decline was caused by the introduction of a new predator. Maybe there's a new insect, for example, that's preying on the larvae of the bees, and this is causing the bee population to decline. Maybe it's due to climate change. There might have been several years of hot, dry weather that makes normal flowers unavailable, and so therefore there's just less food source for the bees in general. Maybe there are some environmental toxins that we're not aware of yet that are causing some die-offs for these bee populations. Maybe there is a parasite or a disease, some sort of fungus or mite that is attacking these colonies and leading to these mass die-offs. Maybe it is human disturbance of bee foraging sites. Maybe there used to be 
acres of an open field where these bees could go and collect pollen. And now it's being used for human use, a mall or a development of some sort. All of these are good guesses. There's also other guesses that you might have come up with that I didn't note, note here, but these are all good guesses. So how do we figure out which one is true? Well, scientists discovered that there's evidence that chemicals in an insecticide are linked to these bird and bee deaths. The chemical was neonicotinoids, which are widely used in insecticides. As you might be able to tell from the name, it is a chemical that is derived from nicotine. And how this works is it affects the nervous system of insects. So if it gets sprayed on a crop, for example, and an insect comes and tries to eat that crop, it will cause nervous system failure, the insect will die, and then that protects the crops. But no one's really sure yet what the level um, becomes lethal for bees, or if there's other factors that are playing a role as well. But this just seems to be a promising first step where we can look to see what's going on here. So how would you tell if the decrease in bee populations were due to these neonicotinoids, or they were due to some other factor? This is another one to think about for a second. Pause the video if you need to. But how would we be able to tell what these bee population decreases were due to? What's a question that we could ask just broadly to understand what's going on in the situation? One of the broadest questions is why are these bee populations decreasing? We see this as a problem, the population decrease, but what is going on? Why are these bee populations decreasing? Now, what's a hypothesis that we could test? Remember that hypotheses are a causal explanation. I know this word looks like casual explanation, but it's causal explanation. So a hypothesis could be that exposure to these neonicotinoids is causing the bee population to decrease. But let's think for a second, what does causal explanation actually mean? Basically, a causal explanation is a statement that establishes a cause for the observed phenomenon. A way that I like to think about this is that it's an educated guess to try to explain what's going on. So hypotheses often contain the words cause or because in them. So for example, a good hypothesis could be that bee populations have declined because of this insecticide exposure. What about if-then statements? I know in some high schools, you guys get taught that maybe a hypothesis needs to have an if and then a then statement. If these are exposed to insecticides, then they will have lower body weights. Does this also seem like a good hypothesis? Unfortunately, no, it's not. If then statements always refer to some future event. And so therefore they're predictions, not hypotheses. Remember, hypotheses are an explanation to figure out what happened already. They're not predictions for what will happen in the future. So therefore, if then statements are not acceptable, so remember the causal explanations of this happened because or this is the cause of this, not if then. So going back to our bees, how did these scientists test their hypothesis? First, they determined what would be a good indicator of health, and they determined that bee body weight was a good proxy. So the lighter bees were likely sick, and that would lead to bees dying off and overall lead to population decline. So in order to test this, they trapped and measured the weight of bees that were found foraging at 25 different locations within a single county. They also sampled the amount of insecticide residue at each of the 25 locations. 
Some locations had higher residue concentrations than others, so they did notice that there were some differences going on here and decided to look at the data. Now, let's pause for a second before we go any further. We need to make sure that we understand the difference between dependent variables and independent variables. This might have been something that you touched on in high school, or it might not have been. But these are important things that you need to be able to keep straight, so we are going to talk about this for a second. And again, if you're taking notes, this is one of the important things that I would encourage you to write down. So the dependent variable is the measured variable, or basically what you are trying to find out. In this case, our dependent variable is the weight of the bees, because that is what we are measuring, trying to find out. The dependent variable is influenced by the independent variable. I'll repeat that again. The dependent variable is influenced by the independent variable. The independent variable is the variable that gets manipulated or is the part of the experiment that is different between the sample groups. In our experiment, the independent variable is the amount of insecticide residue. I like to think of this as I change the independent variable. In this specific case, the scientists aren't changing it. They're just measuring what was available in the environment. But let's say, for example, they were doing this experiment in the lab, then what they would be changing was the amount of insecticide present to see if that affected the bee populations. So if that helps you, great. If not, that's fine too. Just that's how it really stuck for me to think about that I change the independent variable and then the dependent variable depends. It's what you're measuring. But however you need to think about it to keep it straight, it is important that you can tell the dependent variable from the independent variable um, because this is important for developing hypotheses and a lot of the experiments that we'll be doing this semester. So once we have data, it's important to know how to graph that data. Making a chart or graph is really a big crucial part of sharing your data with others. What's the point in collecting data if all you do is shove it in a shell in a drawer somewhere and then it never sees the light of day, right? I think we would all agree that the point of collecting the data is to answer a question or a problem and then be able to clearly and effectively communicate our results to others is a crucial step in science. So the first step is to identify your variables. The independent variable belongs on the x-axis, which is the horizontal one here. And then the dependent variable goes on the y-axis. In Excel, which is what we'll be using for this class, the data for the x-axis, so your independent variable, should be placed in your left column. I often, for my first step, what I'll do before even this, is I'll try to sketch out with just some scratch piece of paper and a pencil what it is that I'm trying to show, what relationships in my data that I need to show. Because oftentimes what happens is students get sucked down this hole of, well, does it go here? Does it go there? How does this data fit together? And they kind of lose the overall goal and lose sight of what it is they're trying to communicate. So sometimes it's best to just do a quick drawing, figure out what it is you're trying to show, and then you can work towards getting your graph there. Um, kind of goes with this step, but to decide on the right type of graph or chart for your data. On the left here, you can see some bar charts, which are usually good for comparing categories or groups of data. And on the right, you can see the line chart, which is good for showing correlations or comparing change over time. Oftentimes, I'll tell you explicitly what kind of chart or graph I want from you. So if I tell you to give me a bar chart, do not give me a line chart. And if I tell you give me a line chart, don't give me a bar chart. So pretty self-explanatory, but this is also something that this is students up sometimes. So just make sure that you read the instructions carefully and make sure that the graphs or charts that you're turning in actually make sense for your data. 
For example, can you tell me what the relationship is between the two variables on this graph? They're trying to show the relationship between the amount of ketchup people eat and the amount of weight that were gained. But honestly, I have no idea what's going on in this graph, and I'm guessing that you don't either. What about this one? This also is showing the amount of ketchup that is consumed and the amount of weight gain. This one, a little bit better. We can see some trends over time, but I still couldn't really tell you what are these axes showing? What, what are the units? What's actually going on here? Compare that to this graph. We see on the y-axis there is weight gained, on the x-axis is servings of ketchup per week, and then we see a clear trend and correlation between these variables, where the more ketchup you eat, the more weight is gained. This equation shows that you can make predictions from the data. If you gain, for example, let's say about six pounds of weight, or about nine servings of ketchup per week. How much might you gain if you have two servings or 20 servings? This is a useful graph. It's clearly labeled. Um, that's one thing to pay attention to, that the axes are clearly labeled. And also there's a clear relationship here shown in the trends in your data. All of these are important parts of your graph. So just be careful that your graphs actually are clear and are communicating the data in a way that makes sense. So your assignment for this week is to use the data that is supplied to you on Canvas to make a graph in an Excel file. And also you need to make a short video. The instructions for how to do this are up on Canvas. And again, you need to use Excel for this class. If you do not already have Microsoft Office, which includes Excel, then you can download it for free from the OUIT webpage. So it's a free download, but it is something that you are required to have. So if you don't already have it, make sure that you download it. Follow the instructions in the document titled Graphing and Video Assignment Instructions. It is available in your first week module on the Lab Canvas page. Remember, lab and lecture is separate, so make sure you're looking at the lab canvas page and you should be able to see the instructions for this assignment. Feel free to use Google, YouTube, whatever you like for help with Excel. This exercise is to get you familiar working with data, creating graphs. This is not a test of how well you know how to use Excel right now. So use the resources available to you and um, do your best to create this Excel graph. If after you've Googled it, YouTubed it, you still are having trouble, feel free to contact me. But there are some really great videos on YouTube that walk you through step by step how to make these graphs. So really that will probably be more helpful to you than emailing me. And also is a great first place to step to great first step to take. So if you're still struggling, email me, but start on Google and YouTube first if you're having trouble. You have one week to complete this assignment and upload it to Canvas. So basically, before our lab section meets next week, you need to have this uploaded. And that's all I have for you guys for this first week. Um, I hope that wasn't too overwhelming, but make sure that you get these assignments done and turned in and completed on time so that you're able to get full credit for that. I know that this semester is a little bit overwhelming for a lot of us. There's a lot going on, a lot of uncertainty, but I do hope that you all will feel comfortable reaching out to me and that we will be able to have a great class going forward. If you have any questions or concerns, do feel free to reach out to me. I am here to help you guys. I love science. I love teaching. So if there's any, any way I can Hope you guys with this course do let me know i want you all to do well to learn a lot to have fun with this class so i look forward to meeting a group of you guys next week in lab and the b group the week after that um, i'll have a little bit more instructions about that in the email that i send you but 
yeah, really looking forward to meeting you guys. I hope you're settling in well to Norman and that your first week of classes have gone well so far.